And at this time, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ryan McPherson. He is the chair of the history department at Bethany Lutheran College, and he has authored several books, including Rediscovering the American Republic, The Culture of Life, and Debating Evolution Before Darwinism. As an adjunct professor for the Master of Arts and Theological Studies program at Martin Luther College, he teaches courses in creation apologetics and bioethics. He lives with his wife, Marie, and their six homeschooled children in Mankato, Minnesota. He also serves as president of the Hausvater Project, which mentors Christian parents. Please welcome Dr. McPherson. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, pestilential, capriciously malevolent bully. With these words, and I even left out a few, philicidal, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic. With these words, Richard Dawkins began chapter two, the God hypothesis of his best-selling book, The God Delusion. Richard Dawkins, you may know the name. He's known as the leader of the new atheists. Now, the old atheists simply believed that God does not exist because they didn't think there was any reasonable proof for his existence. The new atheists believe that God should not exist, that our life would be a lot worse if he did exist, that we are far better off without God. In my opinion, I think they lost a few rounds debating on the matters of fact, and they moved to feelings. I don't want God to exist, therefore he mustn't. Unbelievers ridicule Christians for believing the Bible. They say you must be a racist, you must support genocide if you really believe all that stuff in the Bible, and especially for believing the Old Testament. As to chronology, young earth creationists are made to look like fools. Or what about Abraham or Moses or David? Read any world history textbook and you'll discover very quickly that they were but myths or at best legends. Who would actually believe the history or the chronology of the Old Testament? We also receive ridicule as believers for genocide. The God of the Old Testament is capricious, vindictive, violently destructive, commanding his people to wipe out the Canaanites with no mercy. Or what about women? Weren't they treated as second-class citizens? Or worse yet, as slaves? I've heard those comments from Bible studies at conservative churches. Many conservatives, I think, are embarrassed by the Old Testament. Few churches dare to teach everything the Old Testament teaches. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about those ceremonial laws, because the Old Testament itself teaches that those were merely ceremonial laws to be in effect only for the Jews and only for a time. I'm talking about the rest of the Old Testament. Many believers are embarrassed by it. However, the Old Testament is reliable, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's reliable in three senses. The Old Testament is reliable, first of all, as to its preservation. The text is so well preserved that we can reliably state what the text says. The text also is reliable with respect to interpretation. We can reliably know what the text means. It's not my interpretation or your interpretation or that other church body's interpretation. It is the interpretation the text itself shall teach us. And finally, it's reliable with respect to application. We know how it fits reality. We know how the Old Testament applies to our lives, and it applies, as we shall see, for our blessing. We can demonstrate the reliability of the Old Testament in a couple of ways. I'm going to be talking about the internal evidence, the evidence within the text, Hebrew manuscripts, faithful trans translations of those manuscripts. Followed by my presentation, Professor Quist will talk to you about external evidence, history, archaeology, sources from beyond the Bible that also support the Bible. 
My thesis is that in the case of the Old Testament, the internal evidence is so strong to defend the Old Testament's threefold reliability, preservation, interpretation, application, that we don't even need to look at the external evidence. I hope you'll come back for his presentation anyway. <laughs> I just had to do that, Alan. Don't worry, his jokes are better than mine, so you'll want to come back. All right, where the rubber meets the road is that if we learn how to defend the Old Testament's reliability, we'll be ready to answer skeptics when they heap ridicule upon us. And why this really matters is because the Old Testament's Messiah is the New Testament's Jesus, our Savior. That's the central thread in both Testaments. And so everything that Pastor Thompson talked about, that's what's at stake in my presentation as well. Let's get going. Number one, preservation. The most amazing fact about the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament is that it exists at all. No other substantial document from the ancient Near East has survived with anywhere near the degree of preservation as the Old Testament, nor were any of those other documents as comprehensive in their scope. The Old Testament provides the only still existing record that we have of history from creation to the time of Nebuchadnezzar. All of the other sources are fragmentary at best. Some of you were here this morning for another conference in which Pastor Abrahamson talked about the Assyrian eponym list and so forth. If you looked carefully at the photograph he showed, there's a crack down the middle and there's a lot of uh, smudging and erosion. In, this, in other words, the record is incomplete. And even if the record were complete and you didn't have to do guesswork to fill in some of those gaps, guess what? It's simply the oldest PowerPoint tra uh, presentation the world has ever known. It's a list of bullet point summaries of people's names without very much significant historical information. Contrast that with the books of First and Second Kings from the Old Testament, a lot richer historical source. It turns out that the preservation of the Old Testament actually is a fulfillment of prophecy. You see, the Bible itself tells us that no other people other than the Jews, no language other than Hebrew, no religion other than Judaism would survive the tumult of kingdoms from the onslaught of the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and so on. In Jeremiah 46, we read, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you. I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but I will not make a complete end of you. As Bible scholar William White once observed, Alexander the Great and his generals virtually annihilated the social structures and languages of the ancient societies and their, that their empire absorbed. The Babylonians, Persians, and Egyptians ceased to exist as distinct civilizations. Only the Greek or Hellenistic culture remained. Judaism was the only ancient religion and Hebrew the only ancient language that survived the onslaught. Not until about 150 years ago were some of those other cultures rediscovered. Until then, many secular scholars thought they never existed and the Bible was a myth when it mentioned them. So the preservation of the Old Testament is in a class of its own and God had ordained this to be so. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Faithful priests would teach from the book of the Torah of the Lord. Israel's kings were to write for themselves their own personal copy and read from it daily. Faithful kings did this, wicked kings did not. But even in the worst of times, such as when Hilkiah the priest rediscovered the law, then it was revived and once again it was taught during the good days of King Josiah. The New Testament affirms for us also that the Jews, to them were committed the oracles of God. And the Talmud explains that Jewish scribes were carefully trained. This was their profession. So you need to get out of your head what the skeptics have put into your head about that childish telephone game. As if the Old Testament evolved over the centuries through some kind of oral tradition. As if one person whispered into the ear of the next person who whispered into the ear of the next person. And you know the childish telephone game. When it gets over here, the message is very different than what started and everyone giggles, right? This was no laughing matter. The Talmud explains exactly how to be a scribe and it was painstaking care that they took to preserve the Bible. The Hebrew Bible, in fact, utilizes a combination of techniques, rare techniques, developed by a group known as the Masoretes during the Middle Ages. They marked every word of the Old Testament with pointing in order to preserve the vowel sounds, the accents, music to which it should be chanted, as well as the grammatical sense. They counted 
They counted letters and kept a tally. They made marks showing rare spellings in order to say, yes, I know it's normally not spelled that way, but I meant it to be that way. And one other time, three chapters later, the same weird thing's going to happen again, so don't be weirded out when that happens. We meant it to be that way. Those are the kinds of marginal notes with which they protected the text. The Hebrew Bible has been preserved in this Masoretic text with unparalleled reliability. We know this because we can compare it to other manuscripts that predate it by centuries. For example, the Greek vowels included in an early translation of the Old Testament, the Septuaginta from 250 BC or so, those vowel sounds match the vowel pointings later added to the Hebrew text in the Middle Ages, which shows us that they weren't really creating a new sound, but rather the Jewish scribes of the Middle Ages were preserving the sounds that they had always known to be there. Some 180 distinct proper names appearing in various inscriptions stretching back to 2000 BC, the time of Abraham, once again confirm the sounds, the pronunciations of proper names. I guess if you want to be a skeptic, you can invent a tale about 180 faked archaeological discoveries. Otherwise, you can say with me that that's rather strong evidence. And even before the Masoretes added these vowel points in the Middle Ages, let me just tell you this, that Hebrew with vowels, excuse me, Hebrew without vowels is easier to read often than English with vowels. Let me give you four letters in English, O-U-G-H. What sound does it make? O-U-G-H. In the word enough, it makes the uff sound. In the word although, it makes the o sound. In the word through, it makes the oo sound. How do you know which one? Why don't you say thruff instead of through? Or anu instead of enough? You know how to read English, not because of the vowels. The vowels actually trick you most of the time. You know how to read English because someone taught you, right? They knew how to read Hebrew with or without vowels. To this very day, Jews chant from the Torah with no vowel markings. Israelis read their newspapers in Jerusalem with no vowel markings. And so what the Masoretes did in the Middle Ages is they made it, yes, a little bit easier, but they weren't adding. They were preserving what was always known to be there. The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered around 1950, dating back to 200 years before Christ, include over 200 Old Testament manuscripts representing every book except for Esther, and they often match that Masoretic text with near perfection. A few times, some groups of manuscripts differ. They instead match some paraphrase translations that also were circulating in various languages at the time. Jesus and his apostles also regarded the Hebrew text as being preserved. I think it's worthwhile to follow their example. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot and one chittle shall by no means pass away from the Torah till all is fulfilled. Now, a jot or a yod is the smallest of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. I printed it on your handout for you there. The tittle would be a tiny stroke that uh, I actually use my reading glasses to make sure I get these straight. It's basically the Hebrew letter for D and the Hebrew letter for R uh, look almost the same except for a tiny stroke. And there's a few other letters that are easily confused unless you read with care. Just like minding your P's and Q's or dotting your I's and crossing your T's in English, the same idea. So Jesus is saying, don't worry, every detail has been well preserved and I, your Messiah, shall fulfill it. Every word matters. When Jesus was talking, he once said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. And then he fixated on that one word, gods, and made a point about that. The Apostle Paul even more specifically took it down to the level of one letter, and he hung your salvation upon it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. In Hebrew, You can see the difference on your page. It's one little letter, that letter yod, sort of like the S in English that can make something plural. That's how subtle the difference was. But Paul said that was enough for us to be certain of what the text meant. Now, textual critics will heap up piles of ambiguities and problems with the text. They'll say, here's the two manuscripts that don't quite agree, and so on. And so I decided to survey their work. I tried to find the best scholarship I could. I also have read about one-fifth of the Old Testament in Hebrew myself. And so I tried to work between the primary sources and what the lead scholars in the world uh, say. 
The footnote there refers to a work by Emmanuel Tove. He's the world's leading expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book cited there has been published in English, German, and Hebrew, just to kind of give you an idea of this is top-notch international scholarship. And so I pulled from his book some of his chief objections to the text. Number one, that it was obviously an omission. Something was left out of Genesis 4, verse 8, when Cain spoke to Abel, but the text doesn't tell us what he said. How do you know something was left out, would be my reply. Can't the text say they spoke without actually quoting or paraphrasing the content of their conversation? And in fact, that same Hebrew verb, for he spoke, occurs three other times in the Old Testament, at least, that I know of, where there's no quotation that follows. It's true that normally that particular Hebrew word is followed by a quotation. However, there are at least four cases, this being one of them, in which it doesn't happen. So I don't know that that's evidence that something was left out. Number two, was it a scribal error to say that Saul was a year old when he became king? And as the verse continues, when he was two years old, then he goes off to battle and so forth. Can you picture a little toddler going off to battle, leading the Israelites as kings? That's absurd, right? So surely something is wrong with this text. How could the guy be one year old when he became king and two years old when he raised an army? There are some manuscripts, especially in other languages early on, that try to say, well, something's missing. It should be 41 years old, not one year old, but 41 years old. Someone left out the 40. That could be one solution, but I don't think that's the necessary solution. I like to read things in context. You go back a few chapters, and it says, the Lord gave Saul a new heart. Whatever else that means, it means he had a fresh start in life. The Lord gave him a new heart. One year later, he became king. Two years later, he was raising up an army. Not difficult, is it? Did the scribe in 1 Chronicles 1 mistakenly rename Obel from Genesis 10 as Ebel from, from, uh, as, as Ebel now in 1 Chronicles 1? And I think, no, the spelling change could reflect a shift in pronunciation which in turn actually is a specific shift in pronunciation that matches other details we know from standard Hebrew verbs. And so I left a note for those of you who know some Hebrew there that many verbs that begin with the letter Yod in late Hebrew shift back toward a Vav in the Hifil congregation reminiscent of a more ancient form. It's a standard pattern of irregularity. Even the irregulars are regular in Hebrew, you might say. And so, I mean, this is just a dime a dozen. Everyone knows this when you read Hebrew. And why can't that also be an analogy for explaining this spelling shift? It turns out that Emmanuel Tov agreed with me on that last possibility if you keep reading his book. So maybe I'm not so far off, or maybe he's not so far off. Here's my big point. No supposed textual difficulties would change the six-day creation account, the fall into sin, the global flood, the call of Abraham, the exodus, David's dynasty, the Assyrian empire, or the messianic prophecies. We know reliably what the Old Testament says. God has preserved it with unparalleled accuracy. Interpretation is the next point here. The Old Testament is its own lexicon. Now, a lexicon is basically like a dictionary for translators to use. You you look up a Hebrew word in the lexicon to find out what it means so you can translate that verse. And I suggest that you barely need a lexicon. And so so the Old Testament is so big, 420,000 words, with a lot of repetition that you can see it defining those words for you. A stock of three-letter root words provides strong clues as to the meaning of nouns, verbs, and adjectives. 1,900 words occur at least 10 times. So if you don't know what the word means in this context, you have at least nine other examples of how it's used in other contexts. You figure out what it means by inferring from those contexts and bring it back over to the question mark place over here. And many of these words occur hundreds of times. That still leaves us, though, with 6,800 words that are are somewhat rare, fewer than 10 times. What do we do with those? Well, it turns out that 3,000 of those rare words are proper names, and so you actually don't need to translate them. I'm going to read a few that you'll see on your handout. Vashti. You come along, you're reading in Hebrew, and it refers to, to a king who has a wife. She's the queen, and then it says Vashti. Vashti. You know that. Queen Vashti, right? 
Or what about uh, this prophet who's mentioned twice, Hosea? Oh, we say Hosea. Same difference. What about uh, this fellow who's mentioned just twice, Melchizedek? Well, we would say Melchizedek, right? Again, same deal. And it turns out his name is actually a compound of two very common words. You'll see one of them is used 2,500 times in the Old Testament. Melch means king. And then Sedek, used over 100 times in the Old Testament, righteousness. So his name is kind of a play on words, king of righteousness. The fact that his name occurs only twice in the Old Testament poses no problems whatsoever for the translator. The text itself tells us what it means as it uses proper names. Again, that still leaves us somewhere over 3,000 words that are rare and they're not proper names. So what do we do with those? Can we reliably figure out what they mean? It turns out that many of them have common roots with other words that aren't so rare. Let's go to your most well-known psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and as you keep reading, my cup overflows. The word for overflows is very rare. It just occurs twice, two different psalms. What's it supposed to mean? Can you be sure you have the right translation? It turns out it shares a close root with another word that's more common, that means being soaking wet, being saturated. So my cup is soaking wet. It's saturated. It overflows. What's the point? God has showered his blessings upon me to the point that I can't even hold them all. I'm like a sponge that is dripping wet. The Lord is my shepherd. He takes care of my every need. Is there any doubt what that psalm means? No. The Old Testament books in general, and especially those books that contain most of the rare words, Psalms, Isaiah, and Job would be three examples, frequently employ a poetic device known as parallelism. They say the same thing twice, but in different words in order to get their point across. And so from Isaiah 65, we read, then I shall rejoice over Jerusalem. Then I shall take the light in my people. But there shall no longer be heard in Jerusalem the voice of weeping or the voice of crying. Rejoice, take delight, weeping, crying, two different ways of saying the same thing. As you see from the stats I've given you, some of those words occur frequently, other ones not quite as frequently. Imagine you're not sure what the less common word meant. You would immediately know from context what it has to mean. It's a synonym of the other word that shows up in parallel poetic position with it. And from the book of Job, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Iron pen, four times, rare word. Lead, nine times, rare word. Translations might vary a little bit here. But written, 225 times. Every time that word occurs in the Old Testament, let's just take it out and replace it with a blank. And now give your Bible to an eight-year-old and say, read this and fill in the blanks. An eight-year-old could figure out, oh yeah, that must be written. That's the only thing that fits all these blanks, right? When you got 225 occurrences from the examples of context, you could figure out what that one meant. And then from that, we can infer this must have to do with something to do with writing, right? Iron pen, lead. And so even rare words, even without looking beyond the Bible for other archeological inscriptions and so forth, you can zero in on what the meaning means. The evidence within the text defines each word's meaning. The evidence beyond the text, other inscriptions, early translations into other languages, they can be helpful too, and they simply reaffirm what we already know on the basis of the text. Any remaining puzzles are incidental to the main message. We can reliably know the meaning of vocabulary in the Old Testament. What about grammar? It turns out that the Hebrew Old Testament has a lot of unique grammatical features that help us understand its meaning. One is that verbs come in a variety of stems. I gave you an example in an English translation there. To give birth, to be born, to be a midwife, to be birthed, to beget, to be begotten. It takes several different words in English to get the simple active, the simple passive, the causal active, the causal passive. These different nuances in English require several different words in English. In Hebrew, it's all the same word. You just add a prefix or you switch around the vowels that are in the middle of the word. And, and those prefixes and vowels, they follow a very standard pattern. Those among us who know Hebrew know about the call, nifal, piel, puol, hifil, that kind of thing. That's what I'm talking about. And so every verb usually has a variety of forms following that same pattern, which means if you come across a rare form, 
then you can know by analogy from other verbs that are more common how to fill in that blank. It's interesting, this one even goes on, I just ran out of room on the handout, but there's, there's yet another form, and that's kind of the reflexive or contemplative form of the same word in Hebrew. Usually it's translated in English as to have one's name enrolled in the family genealogy. It takes a whole phrase in English, but it's all the same word, to be born, to give birth. It's just different shades of meaning by different prefixes and vowel points. Another common feature of Hebrew is known as the Vav consecutive. It's the telltale sign of the historical narrative. First and second Kings is a historical narrative. And I can say that even if I were an unbeliever. In my research, I read works by skeptics, by liberal scholars, and when they came to first and second Kings, they admitted that it was historical and that it fits quite well with what we know from archaeology and so forth. No one seriously questions that First and Second Kings was intended to be historical, and no one seriously questions that it was at least close, if not downright accurate, in its history. It turns out that nearly every verse in First and Second Kings begins with a verb form known as the Vav consecutive. In English, it goes like this. This happened, and then that happened, and then something else happened next, and so then this happened. It's that and, or so, or next. It's what you string together when you're giving a narrative of a sequence of events. The Song of Songs is 117 verses long. Guess how many Vav consecutives are in it? Zero. Hint, Song of Songs is not historical. What is it? It's an allegory. You can tell this from a mile away because the verb structure is different in it. In fact, I spent 15 minutes and taught this to my Sunday school children in seventh and eighth grade, and they all had it mastered. It's simple, you just have to teach them one word, the word spelled with a vav, which means and, and then say, now count how many verses start with that. It's actually pretty easy. What about Genesis 1 and 2? Is that a poetic allegory? Is that simply a story, a myth to give us meaning for our lives, but it's not literal true? Well, look at the structure of it. The vav consecutive occurs for nearly every verse. It is presented to us as a history of God creating the heavens and the earth. Its literary form is unmistakable. In fact, one scholar even decided to run this grammatical pattern through a computer program, and he ended up with a conclusion over 99% sure that Genesis 1 and 2 is the same kind of text as First and Second Kings. Cantillation marks. The Masoretic text is punctuated to indicate accents, music, and semantic precision. Semantic meaning the meaning of words and how they fit with the words around them. Every verse of every book actually is written to be chanted. Not just the Psalms, but the entire Bible is written to be chanted. And in fact, it's chanted in the synagogue still these days. An example of how this communicates not just the chanting tune, but also the meaning can be found in Exodus 40, where we read, you shall anoint them as you anointed their father. Anoint is used twice, the first time is future. You shall anoint them, the second time is past, as you already anointed their father. The spelling is identical, the accents are part of the clue. And uh, I discovered this one by reading a, a guide for how to chant the Bible in the synagogue written by a Jew. And he used this as an example. He said, make sure you chant it carefully because if you don't accent it the right way, it won't communicate the right meaning. One of the basic things we find in the accents and the musical markings in the Hebrew Bible is the distinction between a conjunctive and a disjunctive accent. Conjunctive accents join together, disjunctive accents separate. It helps us to put words into phrases or to separate one phrase from the other. And those who died in the plague were four and 20,000. It turns out that the accents used tell us where to pause so we understand it. Should it be four and 20,000, or should it be four and 20,000? In other words, 20 comma 004 or 24 comma 000. The markings in the text tell you how to chant it for the synagogue, thus preserving with clarity the correct meaning. There's also a poetic structure found throughout the Old Testament, certainly in the poetical books, but also in the narratives. Parallelisms, as I mentioned before, help to define rare vocabulary and to emphasize the main point. There's another structure very common known as the chiasm. And what a chiasm does is it uh, repeats things but in reverse order. 
And so the pattern would be ABC, CBA. A classic example of this is to be found in Genesis chapter 3. Adam is accused, then what does he do? He turns around and says, oh, that woman you created, she did it. Eve is accused, and then she says, the serpent, he deceived me and I ate. So Adam is accused, Eve is accused, then the serpent is accused. And then what? God judges the serpent. And then Eve is judged, and then Adam is judged. So Adam, Eve, serpent, serpent, Eve, Adam, ABC, CBA. You go in one direction, you come out in reverse. It's called a chiasm, it's very common. And it's also very instructive. Because Hebrew is like a sandwich. The meat is in the middle. When I teach my students to write history papers here at Bethany, I tell them to put the thesis in the introduction at the beginning. And then again at the end, in the conclusion, you hammer home your main points. Not so for the Hebrew mind. The main message is in the middle. What do you find in the middle? A, B, C, C, B, A. Right as it's about to turn the corner there, what do you find? The first promise of the Savior. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will strike your head and you will crush his heel. This is not some cryptic message that you got to wait till the New Testament to discover that that's a promise of Messiah. If you read Hebrew the way that Hebrews read Hebrew, this is like bold-faced prints. It's right at the center of the chiasm. It's the main point. And so Christians are right to interpret it so. There's another chiasm. It's huge. It comes in chapters 6 through 9 of Genesis, the account of Noah and the flood. This one goes A, B, C all the way up to the letter P before it turns around backwards and ends CBA. It spans several chapters. Where's the fulcrum? What's the main point? Genesis 8, verse 1, and God remembered Noah. The pastors among us, if they were to preach on this text, no doubt they would choose that same verse as their highlight, right? God's grace. God remembered Noah. God remembers you. God loved Noah. God loves you. That would be their sermon outline. Did they just make it up? Did they get that idea from their professor at the seminary who says, make sure you always emphasize grace? Well, I know our professors do ask our pastors to emphasize grace, but a more important question is, what would God have us to emphasize? The text itself tells you that chapter 8, verse 1 is the main point. God remembered Noah. A point later repeated, parallelism, when we read these words, and God remembered Abraham. The text itself tells us what it means. Now, I know in the school of hermeneutics or methods of interpretation, there's all kinds of ideas of literal and figurative and allegorical and so forth. But letting the text itself teach us, let's try this approach. Ask yourself what later Old Testament writers did when they referred to earlier portions of the Old Testament. Ask yourself what Jesus and his apostles did when they in the New Testament referred to the Old Testament. Ask yourself what the Jewish Talmud of that same generation said is the correct way to understand the Old Testament. If you do that, you'll find the same answer from all of them. It's known as the grammatical historical method. You take the words at face value, you regard them according to the ordinary way that the people at the time would have used that language, you regard them as referring to facts unless they tell you. And Jesus began speaking to the people in parables saying, well, then you know it's a figure of speech, of course but you begin with that face value grammatical historical basis. That doesn't mean that there aren't times where the text also might have a more figurative meaning or an allegory, typology, but here's the thing. Nowhere do you find Old Testament writers quoting other Old Testament writings and saying it was merely an allegory. Nowhere do you find New Testament writers quoting the Old Testament and saying it was nothing more than an allegory. They always affirm the basic historical meaning and then adding layer upon layer, they enrich the meaning with an allegory. As you find, for example, in the case of Jonah, history in the Old Testament, but then there's a new layer of meaning when we see that he's also a type of Christ. For as he was three days in the belly of the fish, so also the Son of Man shall be buried for three days and then rise again. Typology doesn't deny, but it confirms the historic basis of the text. So in conclusion of this section, the Old Testament tells us how to read it. It is reliable, and it tells us to read itself as a prophetic history of Messiah's coming. With this in mind, we can move next to application. We can start to answer the new atheists and other skeptics who tell us that this text is dangerous and that it ruins our lives. We can say, well, really? I mean, it's super well-preserved. That should amaze you. 
and its meaning is clear because it tells us how to interpret it, so let's begin to apply it to our lives and see what happens. What you need to do is expose the straw man arguments that people bring against you. Often when they ridicule the Bible, they're ridiculing something that the Bible never said. It's a straw man where you construct a man out of straw and then you bully that guy rather than addressing what the Bible actually says. So it's important that we read the Bible and that we read the Bible with others and encourage them to read the Bible so that we see what it says and then we can talk about what the Bible really says. And what you'll find out is that the Bible is reliable as to its preservation, its interpretation, and also now its application. So what about creation? Is that a myth? Is that an allegory? No, it's history. God created the heavens and the earth in seven days of about 24 hours, ordinary days. How do we know this? The five consecutive grammar that I mentioned before tells us to read it as history. The context and the parallelisms instructs us how to define the word day. The cantillation markings, how do you chant the text? This is interesting. There's the repeated phrase, and there was evening and there was morning. That's all conjunctive accents. It's one big phrase. You're not supposed to take a pause. It's one section of music that you chant before pausing. And there was evening and there was morning. Day one. And there was evening and there was morning. The second day. That's the rhythm of the text. And finally, if you want to look to a lexicon that is used by scholars all around the world as the gold standard for what these Hebrew words mean, it's interesting what it says. The Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament defines yom, the Hebrew word for day, as, quote, 24-hour day. And not just that, but it specifically re references Genesis 1, verse 5, as the verse in which that meaning applies. And so the best scholarship in the world says, here's your choice. You either regard Genesis 1 not as some allegory that can be loosely adapted to fit with theistic evolution, but you either regard it as a literal history of young earth creation or else you chuck the whole thing. That's what the best scholarship says. Give that some thought. Genocide. This is part of why people do want to chuck the whole thing. They think God is mean to people. So let's look at that. Did God really ask the Israelites to commit acts of genocide? Context reveals that God's judgment against the Canaanite tribes was not arbitrary, but rather was reasonable, patient, just, and even merciful. In Job 34, we read, Should God repay you on your terms when you have rejected his? The Canaanites had rejected God's terms. You see, God did not single out one race in favor of another. That's racism that leads to genocide. That's not what God did. Rather, God promised to bless all people through Abraham's family, and he permitted many foreigners to share in the promised land blessing with the Jews. Rahab of Jericho, the Gibeonites, Ruth the Moabitess, Naaman the Syrian, all according to the principles of protecting Abraham's messianic lineage. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. God was blessing the entire world through Abraham and his family. God was blessing every race through Abraham and his family. God also was patient. He did not destroy the Amorites in Abraham's day, but he bore patiently with their iniquity. By Moses' time, the Canaanites' iniquity had grown so perverse, child sacrifice, bestiality, and the list goes on, that the land itself was ready to vomit them out. The Canaanites' wickedness, we read in Deuteronomy, especially child sacrifice, deserved harsh judgment. So God was patient, and ultimately God was just. God judged not only the Gentiles, but he also judged Jews. He wasn't a racist who preferred one race over the other. He treated them all according to the same standard. And in time, he came to judge his own people because their iniquity was perverse because they had what Ezekiel called persistent unfaithfulness. Ultimately, however, God's hand in history shows his mercy. Causing kingdoms to rise and fall, he set the stage for Messiah's coming to the benefit of Jew and Gentile alike. You know from your New Testament that Jesus said to go out and baptize all nations, that the gospel is for everyone, but you also know this from your Old Testament. Your handout has a few of those verses cited for you. Already in the Old Testament, it was clear that God loved all nations and he would send Messiah to save everyone. What about women? Are they abused in the Old Testament, treated as second-class citizens or as slaves? No way. The Old Testament granted women higher legal standing than in other cultures, even than most cultures today today. 
even than our own culture in certain respects. Does that sound surprising? All you have to do is read the text. Let's look at the principle of equality. We're Americans, we love equality. Quote, male and female, he created them. Grant both your male and female servants rest on the Sabbath day. Do not covet your neighbor's manservant nor maidservant. Notice how male and female are listed together and treated the same way. There's no difference of treatment according to gender. They're treated the same. Purity regulations back in ceremonial laws applied equally to, quote, both male and female. And every man should set free his male and female slave. You can look up these references for context later, but what you're going to find is a strong practice of sexual equality in the Old Testament, unrivaled by other ancient cultures, unrivaled even today. Liberty. Hebrew women were autonomous agents, free to select whom to marry. They were protected from wanton divorce, capable of owning land, and trusted to manage home-based businesses, including the buying and selling of real estate. Slavery was regulated as a short-term indentured service with masters obligated to provide for females well-being or else to set them free. A man who abused a woman slave was required to set her free. So-called slaves, by the way, would be better translated indentured servants. They were bound to serve for a number of years and usually set free, such as in the year of Jubilee and so forth. And in fact, one slave in particular, Eliezer of Damascus, we are told, was destined to inherit the wealth of Abraham until Abraham had a son of his own. Does that sound like slavery in the harsh sense? Or don't you recognize that we're talking about servants who were really members of the household and well cared for, whether male or female? What about protection? A man accused of raping a woman in a deserted field was to be summarily convicted and sentenced to death but she would enjoy an inviolable presumption of innocence. And so to anyone who may have changed your online avatar to hashtag me too in the past few years, know this, that the Mosaic law tilted justice in the favor of women who were abused by men. Find a society today that would respect the needs of women as much as Moses. It's not easy. A childless, childless widow could not be cast out of the tribe, but was entitled to marry her deceased husband's brother. Widows received special privileges, such as gleaning in the fields and special consideration in the eyes of the law to ensure justice. If a man attacked a pregnant woman, the death penalty was applied, both for her sake and for the child's sake. And so my question is this, what more could you ask for? If you want a passionate defender of human rights, what more could you ask for? The Old Testament teaches that all people are created in God's image and worthy of protection as the body, spouse, property, and honor. The Old Testament teaches that all races have descended from Noah's family, and through Abraham's lineage, all the families of the earth shall be forever blessed. And that foreigners may celebrate the highest of Jewish festival, the Passover. Yes, foreigners may celebrate that on equal standing with Jews. It's all in the Old Testament. Check your handout for citations. The Old Testament teaches that women are to be highly valued. Their lives are to be protected. Their sexuality is to be guarded. And their offspring is to be cared for. The Old Testament teaches that sexuality is a precious gift through which God brings children into the world and the Old Testament safeguards both sexual intimacy and procreation within marriage, forbidding fornication, adultery, incest, homosexuality, and bestiality, behaviors that by their twisted nature lead to desertion, disease, and death. The Old Testament calls on all people to defend and provide for the widow and the orphan and those who cannot speak up for themselves. The most commonly quoted Old Testament passage among America's presidents comes from Micah chapter 6. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Or as the greatest rabbi, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. His commentary, by the way, on the book of Leviticus. And so, my friends, the Old Testament is reliable. It has been reliably preserved, unlike any other text from the ancient world. As for its interpretation, it literally does interpret itself. We know reliably what it means. As for its application, we can reliably apply it to our lives today. Yes, sometimes for judgment and correction, but above all, for grace and blessing and even for eternal salvation.
You see, neither Jesus nor the apostles felt embarrassed by the Old Testament, nor shall we. Far from being a book of legends that foster genocide, misogyny, and intolerance, the Old Testament is the only ancient religious text reporting our true origin, revealing our utter failure, and pointing us back to our creator God. Yes, a God whom we have offended with our sin, but also a God who sent Messiah to reconcile us to one another and ultimately to himself. The Hebrew scriptures properly are to be called the Old Testament, a companion volume to the New Testament. In both cases, the central message is this, Messiah's defeat of sin and death through resurrection, foretold and fulfilled, foretold in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament, the risen Messiah, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. McPherson. We have about 11 or 12 minutes for some questions. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, you can go to the microphone, or if you're up front, you can come to me. Uh, do first introduce yourself with your name and where you are from. Try to keep uh, the presentation of your question within about 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, Peter Snyder, Waniwak, Wisconsin. Thank you very much, appreciate it, a wonderful presentation. Um, the armchair critics love to say that the scriptures have been changed over the years, you, and you make a, a wonderful case for the reliability of it, but do you have any idea, I've never seen any evidence that they put forth that it has been changed. Do, do you know what they're referring to, or is it just a, a accusation that they're assuming it must have changed. Thank you. Sure. I think the last part of your question is the first part of my answer. Is there an assumption involved? And, and there is. And so we have two basic ways of viewing history. One way is from the standpoint of creation and perfection at the beginning, and then a decline as a result of human sin following that. The other way of viewing history is, is an evolutionary perspective, in which you start off with something very primitive and simple, uh, and unreliable that later on evolves into a fuller form. And so many scholars today, when they look at religion in general, they take the evolutionary standpoint. They'll tell you that ape-like ancestors became humans, that the early humans were very superstitious because they were afraid of things like fire and lightning and whatever, and that then they developed uh, spirit worship, animism, and then from that, polytheism, the worship of multiple gods. And then finally, through progressive cultural evolution, some societies, such as the Jews, became monotheistic, just one god. And so they see monotheism, monotheism one god, as the end point of this long development. Back to your question, uh, the Bible then, the scriptures of the Jews, would be at the culmination point of the evolving religious culture that these people had. And then they usually place that to between 500 and, say, 200 B.C., somewhere in that ballpark. Well, even later, they say the book of Daniel often was about 160 B.C. So call it 500 to 100 B.C. is about when they see the Old Testament being written and revised by different editors. And then finally, it becomes uh, kind of codified in the official form uh, that the Jews had by the time of Christ and so forth. So that's kind of the standard story. If that's your beginning point for how you do your research then when you find a little scrap of a manuscript here and one there, you're going to piece it together to complete what you think is the puzzle. But there's another way to begin the story, and that would be to say that Moses lived around the year 1500 B.C., and he wrote the first five books of the Bible. Why? Because the Old Testament itself tells us that, because Jesus and the apostles report the same thing, because the Talmud tells you that in every place except for once, where they raise the question about whether he really wrote, say, the last chapter or so of, of Deuteronomy. After all, it says he died and was buried, so did he write that? And the conclusion is he wrote everything else and maybe someone else, like Joshua, you know, kind of put on the final chapter after he died. All of the ancient historians, Josephus, would give you the same answer, and onward you go. And so a lot of it does have to do with what assumptions you bring to the question, but there's also the question of evidence. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered around 1950, and they started sorting through those, uh, many scholars who were of a more liberal persuasion were amazed uh, 
that you find, uh, you mentioned Isaiah wherever you went, Pastor Thompson mentioned Isaiah 53 earlier. You look at the Isaiah 53 scroll, and I think there's like two or three tiny differences as to the spelling of a word or something, but nothing that's even translatable. Once you take it to English, it doesn't matter which text you use. The ones from the Middle Ages that the scribes kept copying before the printing press was invented, or the one from the Dead Sea Scrolls about 200 years BC. Uh, you, you cannot translate them differently to really show the difference. You'd have to learn Hebrew to see how minor the difference is. So there's a lot of evidence showing continuity. That being said, there are some Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that don't quite fit. But what they do fit is, is some other manuscripts uh, in various languages. And so you do get the sense that some translations or some copies aren't as reliable as others. And how I would answer that would be partly as a matter of faith, showing that we already have a lot of strong evidence uh, that the Bible is reliable. That should get your foot in the door. And then read the Bible itself. It says that God promises to preserve it. It also says that God entrusts it to the Jews to do so. And the result is this Hebrew manuscript tradition that we have before us. Uh, so I think we can walk away with a large amount of confidence, uh, whether on scholarly grounds or also simply as a matter of faith. I think, I think the scholarship and the faith uh, really cohere nicely here when you think through it. Do we have another question? Chaplain Don Molson from here at Bethany. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to get your comment on something. I remember in seminary, uh, one of our Old Testament professors brought up that um, a very unique characteristic in both Old and New, but especially Old Testament, uh, is the ability to self-criticize the author, in other words, or a king, mm -hmm. somebody who had the power to put you to death, and that, that you just don't see that in any other ancient writings. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So, so uh, you know, in a sense, Richard Dawkins is right. There's a lot of embarrassing stuff in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is so honest about human lives, right? I mean, you can tell when David first began to lust after Bathsheba, and then he committed adultery, and then he conspired to have her husband killed, you know, one sin leads to another. I mean, you can just, you can just follow this. It's embarrassing. And yet we teach it in Sunday school. Make sense of that. Well, it's real. Think of our lives. Think of the things we'd rather not say at the microphone today. And then think of all of that being covered by God's grace. And so that's what you find in the Old and in the New Testament. In much other literature, you find bragging about how good the king was. In fact, in other cultures, when a new king took over, he would erase the records of the kings who became before him. Whereas in the Old Testament, we have a record, a complete lineage of all the kings. The years that they ruled, the names of their mothers, how old they were when they became king, you know, an extraordinary amount of detail, down to some embarrassing parts about their private life. And then through it all, you see God's mercy for them, and you begin to see God's mercy for you. That's also something you don't find in the literature of the other nations, is God's mercy for all people. More questions? Katriana Berglund from Mankato. I, I was talking to someone who's trying to um, combat the Bible, and he was talking about the word now in Genesis. And I've noticed that a lot of times, I mean, nowadays we use now to mean in this moment, but a lot of times in Genesis they'll say, now this happened. Does now mean a different thing in the Old Testament versus how we use it today? Yeah, great question. So usually when you're reading, like say in Genesis, this happened and then this happened and so then this happened and now that happened, and then next, now, so then, those words in English are usually simply the, the letter vav, which is pronounced v, um, it, and, it's, and it's parked right at the beginning of a word, it means and. And so that's that vav consecutive I was talking about. You'd have the v sound parked at the beginning of a verb. They tweak how the verb ends a little bit to, to make it all mesh together. It's called a vav consecutive, and it's this happened, then that happened. In English, we often uh, add then or so or next, or one of those words or now, as a way of um, not sounding so stilted. Otherwise, it would be and, and, and the whole way through. Um, in the New Testament, there tends to be maybe a little more precision. In other words, a special word that means then versus now and so forth. Uh, 
Uh, so it helps to check back at the languages. And you'll see translations vary in a place like Genesis. When do they say so or then or next or and? Uh, they might flip-flop it, and that's why, because it's kind of a judgment call of what sounds the best to, to our ears as English speakers. So I wouldn't hang too much uh, interpretation off of those subtle words in the Old Testament particularly. We have time for maybe one more question. Yes, please. Nathan, Nathan Kranz from Gaylord. Um, the modern, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the King James Bible. Um, I loved your, your speech here. But uh, the modern versions, they're getting so many versions. Um, I'm especially alluding to the modern uh, New International Version where they had gender, gender neutral. Do you see that as a mistake happening from the interpreters or the translators? or transcribers, or do you see that as something more nefarious or uh, willful, if you, you understand my meaning? I think so. So, in general, I'll tell you what I appreciate about the King James Bible from 1611 is that it's very precisely translated. Uh, if it has a fault, it's that it's too precise, that it makes it awkward in English, not just the these and the thous, uh, but even if you clean that up and change it to you, uh, to some English readers, it's, it's higher level. It's like 12th grade English. Uh, for level, and most 12th graders can't read 12th grade English in America today. Um, and and I, I didn't actually mean that as a joke. I gave another presentation in February on literacy, and government stats show that to be the case. So the question is, how do we communicate the gospel winsomely to a generation that is fast becoming functionally equivalent? Uh, to some degree, it might be helpful then, then to have translations uh, that are more flowing in their, in their English. Um, I, I think it's good to use a variety of translations so you can cross-check and then ultimately to have uh, a knowledge of Greek and Hebrew or to have a pastor who does or to have someone where you can, you know, check those things. You asked about gendered language in particular. Um, we need to be very careful about pronouns referring to God because the Bible does call God our father, not our mother. And that's clear throughout the Old and the New Testaments. I don't think that's the product of a male chauvinistic culture. I think it's simply the truth. And to those who had a father who did not love you, I'm deeply sorry, but I want you to know that you have the father who does love you. And that's the solution, not to call him your mother, but to call him the father and to realize that he solves that problem rather than ignores that problem. That being said, uh, there are some New Testament translations that will say translate brothers and sisters rather than just brothers. Personally, I think if it says brothers, everyone knows that that can include brothers and sisters. I think many people uh, are comfortable and they don't get alarmed and assume that it's sexist just because it says brothers. That being said, we now have a new generation that's being raised, indeed indoctrinated, to interpret those words in a different way. So I think we need to sit down patiently and talk it through with people. I won't say, you better use this translation and you better not use that. I'd say you better sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk it over and then go back to the scriptures together. I think that's more valid than just, you know, checking off the list that now I've got the best Bible translation. Let's instead make it a lifetime habit of being in the Word of God with our friends and neighbors. Thank you, Dr. McPherson.